through my 54-year-old postmenopausal lens, I definitely notice the calm when I do really heavy weightlifting. Like there is this sense of like, whoa, somebody just gave me like a whole bunch of progesterone. Is that what it feels like? It's like a chill pill. It feels incredible. But then when my brain is racing, if I go for a walk, I love to run. I was a competitive tennis player, so I love to go run. And it just is my mood. It enhances my mood and brightens my brain. And I think that in the cultural conversation around strength training, we've sort of lost, well, what does cardio look like to benefit the menopausal woman? Mm -hmm. And for me, I've gone from running long distance to walking long distance to hiking to rucking to, but there's still a different feel I get in my body when I do cardio. So what, what do you recommend for cardio for menopausal women? Yeah. So we look at polarizing your training. So we hear all that rhetoric about the zone two stuff. And to me, I'm like, mm -hmm. no, when we look at the basic physiology between men and women, women don't need to do a whole bunch of zone two to get the benefits that is purported for zone two of increasing free fatty acid use, mitochondrial use, all that kind of stuff. I tell women, zone two is your soul food. Like I come from an endurance background, yeah. Ironman, Xterra, bikes, everything, right? So I get a bike, I go out, I go out for hours. I love it. That's my soul food. I get lost, I come back, I feel fantastic. But mm -hmm. that's not optimal for this 50 year old body right and it's yeah. not optimal for women who are trying to lose abdominal adiposity who are trying to get better insulin control who are trying to change body composition we need to look at that high intensity work the stuff that we've been pushed mm -hmm. away from doing just from a cultural nuance mm -hmm. the way we've grown up so when we're looking at true sprint interval training, this is 30 seconds or less, as hard as you can possibly mm. go, like full on, full out. Okay. The best way I can teach someone to do that is on an assault bike where you're looking at arms and legs oh, yeah. against resistance. Like everyone hates the assault bike, but 30 seconds, you're yeah. blasted. I was just going to say, my trainer pops me on that and I'm like, oh, fuck, we're doing the assault bike again. I know. <laughs> yeah. So I make people chase meters. I'm like, how hard can you go for 30 seconds? And yes. you have a couple of friends around, go, 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 go. And you see, and then the next one, which is three or four minutes later, because you want three to four minutes recoveries, you're chasing the meters to try to push a little bit mm -hmm. harder. Most people are like, oh, I can do three mm -hmm. to five or eight of those. It's like, oh, we'll see. Because usually it's like two. And they're like, oh, I'm done. Because it's hard. That's what sprint is. Right. It's is. hard. Yeah. So when you're yeah. doing that, you're creating an epigenetic change within the muscle to open up more of what we call the GLUT4 protein gates, which are the way that carbohydrate and glucose get into the muscle cell without insulin. It creates it over mm -hmm. the course of you know, three to four weeks of doing this kind of work. Now, all of a sudden, you have better insulin control because your body has said, hey, skeletal muscle is more sensitive to carbohydrate. We have more of these proteins that translocate to bring carbohydrate in. We don't have to rely much on insulin. When we look at high intensity interval training, which is just a step down from the intensity where the intervals are one to four mm -hmm. minutes at 80 to 90 percent with variable recovery, this is more of a mitochondrial response where we're looking at increasing mm -hmm. the capacity of the mitochondria to use carbohydrate and use free fatty acids to reduce those free fatty acids that are circulating that get wrapped up by the liver and stored as visceral fat. So this is how we're reducing mm -hmm. the conversation of the visceral fat in the body. The combination of the two is really, really important for metabolic health and body yeah. If we're doing that long, slow stuff all of the time, it's not a hard enough exercise stress to create these adaptations that we need to have Estrogen, and progesterone, and to some extent testosterone used to do for us. We're looking for that external stress that is above and beyond what the body can usually, you know, understand so that it creates all these new feedback pathways to benefit our metabolic and our psychological and all of these responses that go to shit when we hit peri and postmenopause. Yes, you know, they do. You know, when you go out and you're long on your long rock or like me going for a long ride 
that's our soul food, right? Because that's how we just get rid of the stress and we get that elated feeling of calmness. And that's endemic because of their backgrounds. But if someone hasn't been doing that, I'm not going to say, okay, now on the weekend, let's go for a four hour ride or three hour rock because that's contra indicative to what we want for the body. 